O Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray that through the preaching of your word, we may be taught to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and in death, and to grow day by day in your grace and your holiness. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. You may arise for the opening hymn. On this 4th of July weekend, we welcome all of you to our worship at Pinewood. The service is before you in your handout. And we begin this day in the name of God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The psalm of the day is the second portion of Psalm 51. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Do not cast me away from your presence. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a Holy Spirit to sustain Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners will turn back to you. O oh Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. We join in the confession of sins. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we are poor, worthless sinners. We have sinned against you with our lies, our lust, our envy, our hatred, our anger, our greed and our apathy. We have taken you for granted. We have ignored your commandments, and we have failed to love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. We come to you to beg your forgiveness. We come to ask for your help and guidance. Yes, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. 
And upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of God's word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And to that we all say, Amen. We join in the prayer of the day. O God, whose gracious presence never fails to guide and govern those whom you have nurtured in your steadfast love and worship, make us ever revere and adore your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. And again to that we all say, Amen. We now join in, uh, today we're going to recite the words of the Nicene Creed. They're on page 22 in the front part of your hymn book. Some of you uh, know it by heart, and some of you that are watching, uh, I didn't type it in, but uh, you should know it. The creeds are the three great ecumenical creeds of the church that every uh, true uh, legitimate Orthodox church body uh, will adhere to, at least uh, on paper and hopefully in practice, even more Orthodox if you do that than you are Orthodox. The creeds uh, are the, really the foundational uh, summaries, uh, documents of the Christian faith. We like to think, well, the Bible is, uh, but these are a distillation of what the Bible teaches. And we have three, uh, Independence Day weekend, we think of the three foundational documents of our country. Uh, Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. And we have three uh, documents as well in the church, Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, and then the big length, the Athanasian Creed, which we did a few weeks ago. Uh, today we'll do the Athanasian Creed, which was written in the early 300s A.D., in the year of our Lord, uh, and gets the name from uh, the Council of Nicaea, the city in the Roman Empire where it was held. Uh, Athanasius was the primary mover and shaker behind this creed. And then later, in, uh, the final creed bears his name just because it's a further exposition of his uh, theology, which is really the scriptural theology on the Trinity and uh, Christology as well. So uh, we'll recite the creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And you uh, may be seated. We sing, uh, My Country Tis of Thee.
first the epistle from Romans 13, first seven verses. And mind you, St. Paul is writing to Romans and to a governmental form that wasn't always nice, that wasn't always uh, pure and the like, especially towards Christians at various times. And what does he say? Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant, to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Thanks be to God. And you may arise for the gospel. And the gospel for today has to be, if it's from Matthew, from Matthew 22. And you'll recognize it well. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity and that you're, you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't uh, swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used to pay the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose portrait is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then he said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So he left them and went away. Thanks be to God. You may be seated for our next hymn, the first two verses of the Battle Hymn of the Republic.
I almost don't want to do a kid's sermon after singing and breaking up the uh, Battle Hymn of the Republic. <laughs> but we'll try. So I've had a time with my garden out in the back 40. I got it planted finally of the things I started from scratch. And I got the weeds, you know, tamped down and I got the black uh, film stuff over so that cut a little hole so your seedling, you know, comes in and grows and doesn't have any competition. Did all that. Did it all right. And about a day and a half after I uh, had planted it, my three hills of cucumbers are all sawed off. <laughs> Chipmunks. Those pesky little critters. And they get right between, I've got chicken wire and I've got deer wire around that and, and whatever, but unless you've got the really, really fine, fine, fine wire, the chipmunks get in. And they had a good time. I lost a couple tomato seedlings too, as it turns out, which I wasn't happy about. That could have been they were just weren't ready, you know, in the dryness and the heat and whatever, and then the heavy rain. So I don't know. But I, so I went up this week to uh, the local farm place and I bought three of his tomato plants, uh, different ones than I have, and, and mine are little, but they'll catch up and his are up here, you know. And so I decided to, instead of the, um, my zucchini hills are coming nice from seed that I recently planted. So I decided I was gonna plant some, some summer squash because I haven't grown summer squash for a long time, and it's good, I like it. If you want a good medley, you'll appreciate this. Take some onion, some summer squash or zucchini, and uh, maybe some tomato if you have it or not, and then some peppers are always good in it, and some uh, garlic, and uh, basil, and then saute it. Nice accompaniment. So summer squash, good for all that. Well, the problem is uh, they're going to be late, but, you know, they'll still come. This one says it's good 45 days. So end of August, I'll have them. And it all starts with a seed. It all starts with a seed, and it ends with the promise of, of great meals with summer squash. And who knows, if they're prolific, I'll probably do two more hills. If they're prolific... You might even get some for free some Sunday. I'll give it to the kids. That way they can kind of enjoy it. Well, I was thinking about that. Freedom is like that. Freedom starts with a seed. A little seed inside people that they want to be free. And eventually it comes to fruition. But there's chipmunks and critters that want to chew it off and prevent that. And of course, we know that as Christians, we call it sin in various forms. But there's one, uh, there's one antidote, one seed that gets planted within us that can overcome all those little chipmunks and critters and all the rest, and disease. And that seed is a seed of faith, and it comes from Jesus Christ, because he's almighty. Nothing can uh, knock him down because he gets right back up. And he did that when he died on the cross for you and rose back up, right? So he's the mightiest seed of all. I got, the, the, uh, uh, get to, I got to help perform a miracle this week. My favorite thing probably I do is when I get to help with a miracle. And I got to baptize little Caden Ambrose Trier. We put the font up here for the day and, and uh, he was baptized and he was a good little boy, too. He woke up during his baptism. A little of water, you know, that was different. Then he went right back to sleep. Good little boy. But what, what did Jesus do? He put the seed of faith into his heart, of love into his heart. Now it's starting to grow, getting bigger and bigger. And that seed sets us eternally free, free forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That's wonderful, and nobody can take it away. Nobody can take it away. So any of you that were baptized, and I think that's pretty much everybody here, that's what's growing inside you. You've got real freedom from God growing right here. Don't take it for granted. Thank God for it tonight. And we'll sing the last verse.
<clears throat> Will you unite our hearts in prayer this morning? Dear Savior, thank you for allowing us to live in a reasonably free country. Thank you for allowing us to freely worship you without fear of reprisals. Thank you for blessing America in and through and because we are Christians, and therefore we are its salt, its preservative. And thank you most of all for freeing us from sin and evil by your forgiving love. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and certainly from Christ our liberating Lord. Our text for today is a little section from Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses, second half of verse 31 into verse 32. Christ here says, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Dearly beloved in Christ, some of my ancient relatives were slaves. And if you go back far enough, I think probably all of us have slave blood in us in some way, shape, or form. Slavery throughout human history has been pretty pervasive, especially in ancient times. Freedom is a sweet blessing, and its freedom is very hard to maintain. Even today, most of us are enslaved by someone or something. If you've got a mortgage on your house, you're a slave to the mortgage and to the bank. You're not free, you don't own it, they have an oblig, well, they have their claws in you until it's paid off. I had a, uh, a member many years ago who had a pretty high-powered job at a company in the area that makes missiles. And he was very smart, and uh, they paid him very, very, very well. And he wanted to move elsewhere, but it took him a while. Eventually he did, but he told me one time, he said, Pastor, I wear golden shackles. I get paid so well that I can't afford to leave, even though I just as soon like to. And he was originally from Florida, so you can imagine. Then there's your debt load overall. We've all got that. If you're sick, the medical establishment has their claws in you, big time. They don't really mean to, but because of uh, bureaucrats and insurers and proving things and all the rest, what happens? They think you have a disease or they think you have an illness or a condition and then they have to order the interminable tests. And they go on and on and on. It enslaves you in that your schedule is no longer your own. <coughs> Fear and depression enslave a lot of people and trap them in its clutches as well. Freedom comes hard. Real freedom. America was founded upon the principle of freedom. Now exactly what does that mean? One of our founding documents, in this case the Declaration of Independence, says what? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And by the way, in those days, I hope everybody realizes when they say men, they mean people. That's just the way it was and the way they spoke. All men are created equal and all are endowed by their creator with life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. But alas, sin in its many forms gets in the way of all that and makes a mess of it, obscures freedom. And we see that in our own lives. We have servitude toward the banks. Various creditors, obligations can pile up and weigh us down. And then you can create your own 
little jail, if you will, of a mindset of fear, of guilt, of shame, on and on it goes. I always think of Ben Franklin when I think of uh, the spirit of 76. Remember what Franklin once said? Neither a borrow nor a lender be. Certain wisdom there, isn't there? There's some freedom there, isn't there? A whole lot of it. The American painter Norman Rockwell, familiar to New Englanders, uh, Lennox, let's see, Lennox is the Museum Stockbridge, and Lennox has one, I think, too, and then up in Arlington, Vermont, is where he, uh, he lived for a while and painted as well. We used to have members that lived up there, and I think the store where they, uh, was, his, was his abode, they had this store, yeah, with the, with the uh, yeah, the potbelly stove and the whole thing. Interesting, isn't it? New England's very small townish in its own way. Well, during the Great Depression, Rockwell painted uh, various covers for uh, such things as the Saturday Evening Post. And during the uh, Depression, he painted a series of four famous covers. And they were called the Four Freedoms. And they were freedom from, see if I can get them right, freedom from, of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, now the froms, freedom from want and freedom from fear. And they became very popular, and you can pull them up on your phone or what have you and see what he has to say in those paintings. They all kind of, you know, interlock in the final analysis. If you can't voice your opinion on something and not feel all intimidated and not be put down because of it, if you can't do those things, well, you're really not free to speak your mind. And when it comes to worship, if you go to church and you fear reprisals, and recrimination, because they went to a Christian church. They went to a Lutheran church. Oh no, they must be a weirdo. On and on it goes. Well, I have a true story. I have to relate this. I was first in New England a while back, and I was talking to somebody, or I think it was my wife actually was talking to somebody, and she's nodding. And this person, uh, they're asking about, well, what's your husband do? Well, he's a Lutheran minister. Lutheran. And this person says, are they Christian? Oh, uh, yeah, and then they, they also, are they a cult, you know, first? And are they, you know, and they're, no, they're Christian, you know, and, and uh, they never heard of Lutherans before. Heard of Martin Luther King Jr. before, but never heard of Lutherans before. Interesting, isn't it? Then there's hunger. If hunger stalks your door, the rest of your life is kind of devoid of a, much happiness, if any. And the final one is fear. Freedom from fear. Mind you, this was written, and uh, the stories behind it and whatever, but the painting itself was composed in the height of the Great Depression what was going on in Europe, the height of the Great Depression, the rise of fascism. So people did watch their speech. They did, some of you know, mind where they worshiped and how often they went and who saw them. They didn't maybe have much food in some cases, and they lived in constant fear over being found out and being denounced. Well, there it is. We live in America, and in America such such freedoms are taken for granted. At least up till now, we have. They're considered a God-given right by Americans. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Without those four freedoms, those words, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, ring terribly hollow. 
in fact, you can say they're non-existent or almost dead. True freedom is an ideal that becomes a person's reality in, with, through, and because of one thing, one person. And that one person is Jesus Christ. Yes, Christianity alone sets the human soul free. Because Christianity breeds hope. Christianity breeds a hope that isn't fake, that's ephemeral, like the early morning fog some of you had. Christianity breeds hope that doesn't disappoint, hope that lasts forever, hope that springs, does spring eternally from the human heart. And in America, because we historically have been a reasonably Christian nation, I'll say it that way, Americans have hope. The farther we get away from Christ, the less hope we have. And that's America today, isn't it? We have hope, but not quite so eternal anymore, is it, for most people? Our hope as Christians finds fruition in heaven. Governments can restrict your movements. Governments can pass laws that some are good, some are bad, some are just, some are unjust. Governments can tax away, can tax away a lot of your happiness. And if you get to April 15th and that's happened to you and you have to write a big check in, you're not usually too happy about it. I pass, I uh, rest my case there. But governments cannot destroy hope, true hope in Jesus Christ. And those are a few of the reasons that we can all be thankful we live in America this day where hope still seems to spring forth. And look at what's happened the last number of months. It still springs forth. Amid a pandemic, people are still hopeful. They haven't thrown in the towel. It still springs forth in the midst of economic malaise. It hasn't destroyed our freedoms yet. And as long as Christians remain faithful to Christ, the nation will be preserved. Why can I say that? That's not a hope, that's a fact. Why can I say that? Because Christ himself says in the uh, Sermon on the Mount that the the salt, remember the salt? Salt's a preservative. Christians are salty. They help preserve the earth. The elect, you and me, those chosen by God, those blessed by God, in humble faith, because of Christ. Those people are the ones that preserve the world. Nations exist only for the sake of the elect. The world exists only for the sake of the elect, you and me. And blessings will then shine forth across our land. Future of America. If you ask most people what the future of America is, and they'd say, our technological abilities. No. No. What makes America great are the Christians in it. You and me. God has blessed America. God has blessed you. Today is all about asking God to maintain and promote those blessings, that blessing specifically of freedom across our land and in our lives. How do we do that? You learn from the past. It's getting more and more popular, it seems, these last number of months, or years, really, to uh, shun the past, throw the past away. We don't need it. It doesn't teach us anything. Yes, it does. Human nature doesn't change. So, People made good decisions in the past, they made bad decisions in the past. They passed good laws, they passed bad laws. There were good people that did 
bad things. There were bad people that did sometimes good things. And what happens? Either you learn from the past or you're bound to repeat the mistakes of the past. That's why you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We humans are imperfect. We Christians, because we still retain a human nature, a sinful nature, are imperfect too. That's why scripture says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All is pretty inclusive. Today, Christ tells us how to go forward as a nation and as individual peoples, or how to enlarge our freedom, we could say it that way. He says, if you hold to my teaching, then you are really my disciples, and then you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. St. Paul reiterates it this way. It says the same thing from uh, one of the letters to young pastor Timothy, 1 Timothy, I believe. All scripture is inspired or God-breathed and is pro- all scripture. So all of it is God's word, all of it is God's teaching. And is profitable for what? Doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. And then comes the part everybody always re- forgets about. The result clause. The result is what? So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thoroughly equipped. That means the Ten Commandments are extremely important as a mirror to our mistakes and failures. They are extremely important to nations and people to take to heart, to curb negative, hurtful, slavish impulses. They are important in this regard as well, that we so guide our lives and our behavior by them that grace and blessings may abound. That's the meaning of Paul when he says in Romans, righteousness exalts a nation. Rightness with God exalts a nation. That's how it does it. The greatest source of such freedom, however, is freedom from guilt and freedom from shame and a clean conscience. And that comes through Jesus Christ. That the Son of God gives us as a free gift, one on a cross. What gives you fear ultimately in life? Well, the unknown, anything bad that I can't control. Take what I love, what I hold dear and cherish away from me. I fear that. The unknown, in other words, the bad part of the unknown. What crowns that fear? Death. But death is not a fear for us because Christ has died to our sins and been made alive unto righteousness, rightness with God for us. He arose from our grave. He gives it to you as a gift. America needs to wake up to this fact If your soul and your conscience aren't free from guilt and shame, you're a slave. It's that simple. You're a slave. So what are you going to do about it? Look to another slave. The one that costs 30 pieces of silver. The doulos. The doulos means slave in Greek that you'd buy for 30 pieces of silver. The one that became a slave to and for you and then set you free. As long as you're stalked by fear, you've got a slave's mentality. But we're Christians and Christ has taken that away. So no matter whether your shackles that hold you are gold and made of gold, No matter whether they're made of high tensile steel, no matter matter whether you're caged in a mindset of your own construction or one that others impose on you through groupthink and social ostracizing, in actuality, you people here today are Christians, which means you're free. 
really free. Embrace him. Embrace Christ who made you free in humble faith. Hold your head up with joy and be proud to be an American. But most of all, and above all else, be proud, eternally proud, to be a child of the Most High God. Amen. Please arise. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the, uh, we won't have the offering because that's taken at the door, but uh, the offertory, which is a fun piece that she has worked up for us. Dear Savior, give us grace to lovingly and unselfishly dedicate ourselves and our possessions for use in your kingdom. Mindful of our shortcomings, we bring this offering to your altar in a spirit of meekness and repentance. Forgive us all those times that we have been uncharitable, sometimes greedy and often selfish, and open our hearts to give to you in love as in love you gave yourself for us. Here is for the glory of your holy name. Amen. And the congregation may arise and join in the responsive prayer. Today we include in our prayers uh, our brother in Christ, John Cray, who probably is watching right now at Mass General Hospital. John's been in for be two weeks on, on Tuesday coming up. And uh, he had some, well, flu. Anytime you've got heart issues, you've got fluid issues and the buildup of fluid issues in the lungs and the body and all the rest. And, He's, uh, he's got those issues, has for a long time, and they had to regulate his medication. They finally got him on a new one that seems to be doing wonders. Or as we would say in the church, it's a miracle. And uh, so he's feeling better. He probably will come home Monday. That's the latest news. So if you send him something, send it to the house. Uh, in the, uh, that's on the online directory you can find all those addresses too. And then of course we pray for America today as well. O Lord our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on this earth. We praise you for your grace and blessing. Strengthen your church and all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed 
to troubled souls everywhere. We bring you our requests for the various structures of our society. Bless our national, state, and local governments. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Invigorate our land and our schools, inspire and promote a responsible citizenry, arouse curious minds to the wonders of your creation. Strengthen our families, make our parents wise and committed, and cause our children to be thankful and loving. Uh, dear Savior, we thank you that you, as the great physician, have enabled those earthly physicians attending our brother in Christ John, enable them to uh, diagnose, but more importantly, get the right medication that his body tolerates and uh, to help him. And he's on the mend. A lot of prayers have gone out for him in that regard. So thank you for that and answering those prayers and uh, continue to give him uh, patience and uh, fortitude as he trudges on and uh, give Carleen uh, a lot of patience and fortitude as well. They've been married for many a year, 42 years, and well, she's been a wonderful wife in every respect to John, and he a husband to her. And so bring the most romantic couple in the church back to us soon. Also today, we ask that uh, you watch over and bless America. Those aren't just words, those aren't just uh, some platitudes that we mouth. We mean it. Our nation needs help. Our people need help in a multiplicity of ways. So let us go forward learning from the past, learning from our forebears, learning right from wrong, good from evil, learning to redirect ourselves to a love of you, to an appreciation of your ageless words of truth and wisdom as found in scripture, because that's the only way our country and the people in it are ever truly going to find freedom. Gracious Father, we boldly ask you for these blessings in the name of him who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The uh, closing hymn is America the Beautiful, and we'll stand for it.
now the Lord bless you and keep you, and the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be most gracious unto you, and the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. seated. Thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears, right? Yes. I never knew what alabaster was really all about until I was in Italy and we went to uh, um, 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 Volterra, the ancient Etruscan town of Volterra, which is a cool town. And they mine alabaster there. And they've got all these shops. And there's different colors. There's darker, a little darker, and then there's the golden, and then the best is the real light. And they actually would uh, make it so thin that they would do a window with it to make uh, the light come through into the houses in ancient times. And of course, all the statues and whatever else. But alabaster glows kind of when it's sunlit. It glows. And it's gorgeous. And it looks very um, uh, perfect and just, uh, uh, I don't want to say snow white because <coughs> it's not snow white, but it, it just gorgeous colors. You know it, alabaster. You've been there and seen that stuff. And so when you think of that, thine alabaster cities gleam, that's like the best that you could, they could imagine, you know, the writer. Undimmed by human tears. No pollution, just human <laughs> tear pollution. It's an interesting turn of phrase, and I think of that always when I, when I uh, sing that. Uh, today, after the uh, service, if the guys stay, please stay. We need six guys for a quorum for the voters meeting. One, two, three, Freddie out in the van. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Well, we got, we should have a quorum. <clears throat> so, and you've got yours, Madam Secretary, you've got your uh, notebook so you can take quick notes. Uh, last time the council met in March, right before we shut down, uh, we had agreed to uh, have a voters meeting to uh, okay the expenditure. The first one, it's a two-part deal, but the first one is uh, about approximately, we'll just say approximately, uh, 6000 to repair the and replace the, uh, the leathering of the uh, great engines that control some of the internal stuff on the organ. The organ is 120, 21 years old. And some of those probably have never been replaced. If they were, they were done in the 20s uh, when Frazee did some work on it. And, and so, and if it might have been worked on a little bit, update, well, a little bit, uh, 40, 50 years ago as well. They're tired. And there's a couple of those that control some of the, uh, the top notes in the grate that are out. So Silka can't basically play some of that stuff. And it inhibits, so it's time. And so the proposal is to do that. And also we need to take Hefty's, uh, Council is a met, so <clears throat> as long as we're having a voters meeting, we'll take David and Naomi and, and the little one uh, and transfer them to, there's a, uh, a Wells Church in Racine, Wisconsin that they enjoy and they want to uh, have that transferred there, their membership. So I think that's pretty much the news. Uh, take good care, all of you. I hope you uh, have had a reasonable 4th of July. Uh, it's been different, that's for sure, but uh, that's okay. Oh, I have to relate a story, just a brief story. So 4th of July for the minister and with dogs is never a fun time because the neighbors, some of them, uh, decide to shoot off fireworks. 
and it, most neighborhoods are like that. And dogs go, ah! <laughs> and they don't like it. And so this year we, we have it, and there were a lot around here. We've got some new neighbors that enjoy that, I guess. So I came out of church about 20 after 9. It was starting to heat up. I get home, and my wife has Tori on the bed. With, with uh, The house is all shut up. She's got the, the both Austin air purifiers on full bore moved into the bedroom. So the white noise. See, this is all about white noise. And the fan running and whatever. And, I, you know, Tori didn't make hardly a sound. She couldn't hear it. And so I enjoyed watching a little something on TV, but uh, she enjoyed that. And then Tessa was under the bed. So if Tori doesn't bark and growl, Tessa's quiet. Takes her lead from the head dog, you know. So, and uh, so about quarter after 10, I, Deborah Ann came in. Is it safe out there yet? <laughs> you know, And it was. So we got them out and they were all happy. But uh, that's how ministers spend the 4th of July weekend. Uh, doing the bulletin, learning the sermon, and keeping the dogs free from uh, fireworks or thereby trying their by. So hot time in the old town, let me tell you. Uh, take good care, all of you. Have a good week. God bless. Mm -hmm.